Hi everyone, my name is Cindy McDonald and I am an entrepreneur, an educator and a producer. And one of the things I love to produce is interviews with experts in subject matters pertain to education. And as an instructor in the UCLA program, the College Counseling Certificate program, I love to talk to people about the different topics we cover that relate to helping our students in their journey toward higher education. And today I'm so pleased and honored to bring to you a UCLA College Counseling Certificate alum, right, Katie? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Katie Anderson from College Fit, located in Southern California. Katie has been an IEC for 10 years and she has a specialization working with athletes in addition to working with students in, um, in an overall general college counseling um, perspective. Did I get that right, Katie? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so as we talk about, today we're gonna to talk about athletes and what that means and what some of the special things that athletes need to do. But before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background and journey has been? Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so my background, I grew up in Southern California. Uh, I was a three sport athlete in high school and I told my parents I wanted to go back east to go or the Midwest to go to college. And so I ended up getting recruited for volleyball at Brown and soccer at Duke. And at the time, Duke was starting their very first women's soccer team. And that school was just an, a great fit for me. So I ended up uh, going to Duke and playing soccer. So I was a member of their very first women's team. And I always remembered my the, the sort of the full experience I had throughout high school and, and going to college in terms of how the types of support that I got. Um, I very unusually at the time in the 19, late 1980s, my parents had hired a college counselor. Um, there weren't many people doing this at the time, but there was a gentleman in my area who did that. And so um, after I played uh, college soccer, I, I played for two years and I ended up leaving the team. Um, I sort of saw the writing on the wall. We, were, we went from non-existent to playing in the national championship in five years. So um, <laughs> it, got, it got very competitive very fast. So I, uh, I decided to leave the team and uh, move on and do sort of normal student things. So I got to go on study abroad. I was an RA. I worked for the school newspaper. I did lots of things that would help me build a resume for my first job. Um, after college, I worked in uh, software industry and web design agency business uh, in the United States, as well as in the Netherlands and in Norway. Um, and when my husband and I moved back to the United States after living in Norway for over six years, um, I had two small kids at home and I decided I was going to stay at home with them for a bit. And then I decided I needed, I needed to do something. <laughs> I could, staying at home was, was not going to be a, a good situation for me. So I, uh, I, again, recalled that a great experience I had with that college counselor and decided that I would start my own college counseling business, but really focus it on athletics. So I went to UCLA, got my college counseling certificate, and then started on my journey through the athletics recruiting part, but being a really at this combined resource. So the business I started in 2013 was called, is called College Fit, and the website is www.collegefitoc.com. Um, a few years later, I got in touch with David Steckel, who unfortunately um, passed away in 2021. But back in 2015, he and I started sort of joining forces because he was already doing the athletics recruiting part, but he didn't do the academic side. So he and I partnered together and we formed the Student Athlete Advisors, um, which I'm also still running today. And I've invited in a few other college counselors to join me in that effort because I feel like you know that effort was really focused on training counselors how to do the athletics recruiting part. And in fact, today it's not only become an educational resource, but a partnering opportunity. So we partner together with college counselors who don't have this expertise, but want to be able, don't have, you know, don't want to give up their, um, their client uh, to someone else. So we actually offer a, a partnership and we've really been promoting this whole partnership concept across not only athletics, but all, all the different subspecialties you find as a, as a college counselor. And it's, 
I think it's helped all of us be better at what we do because we have a network to lean on. So I've been doing that since 2015, and um, David and I uh, won the um, IECA's Making a Difference Award in 2021, and that was a very nice honor. Um, and I'm uh, I'm a member of both IECA and HECA, and I run the affinity group for IEC's Advising College Bound Student Athletes for IECA. So. Um, I would say that, you know, being involved in these professional networks, not just being a member, but actually being an active participant is a, a really important, has been important for my own career, but I would advise any of you <laughs> interested in really taking this to the next level is getting involved is, is really important. So what about um, like NCAA or NAIA or some of those other um, organizations that that sponsor the, the the teams themselves or that the colleges belong to. So have you had involvement with them at all? Oh, yes. Well, when I first started, it was kind of funny. I, I actually did my internship as part of the UCLA program for a public high school in our area. And I was on the phone all the time with the eligibility center. I ended up being sort of this bridge between the academic guidance department who didn't have a lot of um, experience in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then bridging it with uh, the athletics department who had a ton of kids who were going off to play college sports. And so um, that worked out really well. Um, so I, I really got my feet very dirty with, um, you know, learning, learning the insides of how the eligibility center worked. Um, but after that, then I kind of had to build uh, more experience with the overall recruiting process with the NCAA and NAIA, and to some extent, junior colleges as well. Those are all opportunities for kids to be able to play sports in college. So, um, and I would say that over the years, especially recently, um, you know, after kind of coming out of this COVID era and moving back into athletics, I think that there have been a number of pretty major changes that have happened that some of them only affect the super high flyer athletes who are the blue chip athletes who are, you know, you hear their names, you're watching them play on television, but some of them kind of affect everyone. Um, you know, some of those big changes uh, include things like the fact that the NCAA just recently um, changed their rules and they no longer require a five official visit limit for division one schools. So it used to be that if you were getting recruited by a division one school, you could only take five official visits where the school is the one that pays for that visit. There's now no limit on that. So again, oh. most, ki most kids that I work with aren't getting even a total of five. So it doesn't really impact them or their division two, um, or, you know, they're being recruited by schools that are division two or division three or NAIA schools. So again, that's pro you're probably talking more basketball uh, players and, and football players that are going to have that sort of, um, you know, where that's a real benefit to them, but certainly an impact. Other things that I think really have uh, been helpful, the, L the NCAA Eligibility Center, they um, recently, or recently, they back a few years ago when COVID hit, they removed the requirement for SAT and ACT scores to be part of the eligibility process. They, what they did recently was basically say, this is a permanent change. Um, we are no longer gonna require this. Um, so really it's up to the student athlete to have a strong uh, transcript because that's really what's being evaluated when they decide if you are academically eligible to be able to play at a division one or division two school. Um, other things, the uh, transfer portal has impacted. We, we saw, if anybody watched, uh, uh, March Madness this past year, you know, you saw some teams come out of the blue and like, where did they come from? <laughs> uh, or, or some teams that ha were, were full of transfer students, um, where the, the team had been totally reconstructed out of, you know, from scratch with transfer students. And the, the transfer rule that changed was that, um, again, you used to, if you went into the transfer portal and you, you transferred to another school, you had to sit out for a year before you could play. So it kind of stopped people, you know, kids from doing the transfer thing. Well, now you can transfer and play right away, which completely shifted um, you know, a lot of things. Now, again, does that affect most kids playing at most schools? Maybe not, um, but certainly those you know, really talented athletes who are looking at those really top ranked schools for their sport, um, you know, that could be something that they need to at least be aware of. Um, the name image likeness rules, NIL, that's another one that has really um, changed the uh, student athlete's ability to um, benefit financially 
from their you know, name, image, and likeness. Um, it used to be that colleges were the one they, ones making all the money off of their, uh, you know, the having these hot recruits um, play for their schools, and now kids can take advantage. Again, this would be one where I would say, I have yet to work with a student athlete. That's just who the kids I typically work with who have taken any advantage of those opportunities to make any big financial gains. But you don't have to be a huge all-star, you know, amazing athlete, blue chip athlete to be able to take advantage of those rules. Um, the, the everyday average athlete can take advantage of those things um, in many different ways. So um, those are, you know, that's just something that I, again, I see that uh, could, could choose to take advantage if they want. Um, and I think that one of the, I mean, there's plenty of other things that have changed, but I think that um, COVID uh, and the fifth year of eligibility, um, when, when COVID hit, uh, the NCAA decided that they would give a fifth year eligibility to those kids who were in college at the time. And that has, that the impact of that has been that kids were sticking around for that fifth year and either they were staying and playing for five years uh, before they had five years in which to play for, and now they had, you know, another year of eligibility. So um, either they were staying at the college where they were, uh, you know, were originally and playing for that fifth year and maybe staying for getting a master's degree or something like that, or they were transferring or not transferring, but maybe graduating out and popping up somewhere else at a totally different school as a master's degree student. <laughs> having only one year of eligibility left, but using it to their full advantage. Um, and, uh, you know, that how I've, I've had a number of kids who have, um, you know, gone to USC Business School or gone to, uh, you know, some, or actually two of them that went track and, um, and swimming, who both went to USC Business School um, as master's students, because they were really, by the time they were 22 years old, they were pretty hot athletes. So, um, that worked out really well for them. So again, we're, but we're seeing the end of that right now where that's all flushing out of the system and things are kind of getting back to normal in terms of uh, roster sizes, um, budgets, all the things that <laughs> got a little maybe crazy there for a while. And now it's kind of hopefully looking a little more normal and just the economy doing what it's doing, right? Is sort of putting pressure on making sure that things get normalized. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, but it is interesting to see the changes, like what was before COVID and what it is after and which ones are gonna stick and which ones are gonna go away. And that, ha and we're still in that process of, of shift, you know, sifting all that out. Um, so looking at that and as parents or as counselors and advisors, how do students pick? You mentioned how you were a multi-sport um, athlete. How do you pick which sport to play in college? So if you are a multi-sport athlete and you're trying to figure this out, especially if you're kind of, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior year, and you're still, uh, you know, wavering on that issue, some of it gets down to just where you're getting, you know, where you're getting noticed. Um, a lot of kids, usually by their junior year, have sort of specialized. You have they kind of pick their pick their sport, and they're sort of focused on playing. Uh, maybe they're playing for their high school, but they're for sure playing for a club team. Um, I I don't know many athletes who can play two club sports. <laughs> <laughs> and manage, you know, being a good student and doing all those things that can be, I mean, financially, that's almost crazy. Um, and from a time perspective, it's, it's a lot too. So, um, but I have, I certainly have had students who have made that, um, you know, I had one student who tried to get recruited for basketball and really wasn't getting traction with the schools where she was thought she was capable of playing, switched gears into soccer because she had been a soccer player all along too, but just didn't think that's where the opportunity lied. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, boom, she started getting traction because other girls on her soccer team were getting recruited. She was getting noticed too and decided, oh, maybe I better go the soccer route. So sometimes that can be uh, a really hard one. Just know that at, at a division one school or a division two school, your chances for playing two sports in college are probably none. Um, most colleges will recruit you for one sport. Having said that, though, at a Division three school where there's a little bit of a different balance where you're a student first and an athlete second, um, it may be possible for you to play two sports. You know, if you play, for example, um, 
water polo and swim is a classic one where you, you know, water polo season is in a totally different season than swim. And pretty much those coaches are expecting your training for, <laughs> you're going to be training, you're going to swim laps anyway. So, yeah. you know, or um, there was a crazy story in uh, the uh, Tales from the Small Time, which is a book that was written um, about Chapman University uh, when they transitioned from being a D1, D2 sort of hybrid school. They gave up $750,000 in athletic scholarships and went Division three. And there's some really funny stories in this book about um, a baseball player, a pitcher who had been injured. And it turns out a typical D3 school, the pitching coach was also training the cross country runners <laughs> because he was doing double duty on baseball and um, and cross country. And he noticed that his hit one of this pitcher who was injured and was just had kind of not been training like he normally would. He's like, look, if you want to stay in shape, come join our cross country workouts. We'll get you running. And he was this kid was horrible. He came in last in every race. He at one point he quit because he was just so bad. And then he decided, nope, I cannot live without being an athlete. I'd rather lose I'd rather come in last in every race than not be an athlete. And so he stuck it out and, you know, but you can do that at, you know, I'm not saying every division three school would allow you to do that, but certainly I think that, you know, th those opportunities might uh, be a little bit more possible at a, at a D3 or, you know, type school. So. So you've talked about, you've mentioned D1, D2, D3, those are all NCAA divisions. Can you explain a little bit more about those and what the difference is between the three divisions? Sure. So um, the divisions are typically schools are in just one division, although there are some schools that do have like one sport that's in another division. <laughs> so that's a very kind of rare occurrence. For the most part, a school is a division one, division two or division three school within within the NCAA. Um, D1 schools have the largest budgets. They have the largest time commitment on the part of the athletes. They have um, athletic scholarships and most with outside of, um, I would say that the athletic scholarships could be divided for some sports. They are what are called headcount sports. That's for the guys, that's football and basketball. And for the girls, that's women's volleyball, women's basketball, tennis, and gymnastics. And the headcount sports are sports only of D1 schools where um, the, scholar, the athletic scholarship is an all or nothing scenario. You either get one or you don't, but the coaches cannot divide up the amount of the pool of money. All the other sports in division one and in division two have are considered what are called equivalency sports. And those are sports where you have a pool of money and the coaches can divvy them up any way they want. So again, you have to be aware of what sport you're playing and how the scholarships work. Um, so again, D1 schools, biggest number of, um, biggest time commitment, biggest budgets. Um, then your the Division II category, those, those schools also offer athletic scholarships and um, maybe just, but not maybe as many, the scholarship limits are a little bit lower. Um, they may not all be fully funded. I mean, at any, at any of these schools, they may not fully fund. You have to ask if the, if the scholarships are fully funded. Um, there's maybe just a slightly smaller time commitment on the top part of the student athlete, but it's still a pretty hefty commitment. Um, and you're going to find a lot of academically, you're going to find a lot of the Division II schools are kind of more mid-range schools. Um, here in California, a lot of us are familiar, familiar with um, obviously the Cal State schools and the Western Undergraduate Exchange schools as a collection of public schools in the Western U.S., many of those schools are in division two. Um, so again, you're not gonna find many super high academic schools in the division two you know, group of schools. However, there are some, I mean, you've got Colorado School of Mines as an example. Um, so uh, you know, don't, don't overlook that if you've got a high academic student. Then you've got division three and division three schools offer a range of academic uh, possibilities. The super, super high flyer, you know, academic schools, the MITs, Caltech, Wash U, Emory, <laughs> you know, you name it. There's a, there's a very long list of super crazy top academic schools in division three, but there's also a range um, for all types of students. And the biggest difference with division three is they do not offer athletic scholarships. However, they do offer uh, merit aid and need-based aid to, to uh, student athletes um, who qualify. 
And so you will find that division three schools, they offer money, they just do it in a different way. It's not called an athletic scholarship. And I would say that, you know, again, there, I think I mentioned it before, they, their mantra is sort of student first, um, athlete second, whereas I think you'd find at the D2 and D1 schools, they're very much athlete first, <laughs> student second in terms of priorities. And um, so those D3 schools are, I'm a huge division three fan. I think they've really got it, uh, got it right in terms of, you know, kids who want to put uh, emphasis on being, uh, being a top student and come out the other end with a focus on the next part of, you know, phase of life and that they don't feel that they've had to compromise anything, uh, you know, to get to do all of these things, be an athlete and be a student. Um, I really love that. Um, but it's really important to note that there are no hard delineations between these different groupings in terms of athletic competition. You will find that there are D2 schools that can beat D1 schools and D3 schools that can beat D2 or D1 schools. So don't, you can't think of them as this sort of like layers where it's a hard stop on this is better than that. It's not the way it works there. It's more about what, what is the right fit. You're going to find that D3 schools are typically small private schools, um, although some of them are bigger, like NYU, for example, is kind of the, you know, the opposite of a typical D3 school in terms of size. Um, but again, knowing your student athlete, knowing their grades, you have to know grades, you have to pay attention to where in the country they want to go. Um, what does their financial need situation look like? Are they a full pay student? Are they a high need student? Are they somewhere in between where the family says, I, I, don't want to pay eighty thousand dollars a year, but I, I will if I have to. You know, there, you got you have to have flushed out all of that information to know where your your students the best fit. And then very quickly, NAIA schools are typically um, small, private, and mostly religious, but not all of them are religious schools. Um, again, totally separate athletic association governing body there. Um, their rules for um, eligibility academically are a little bit different. Um, so you kind of have to look at those in a, a, a little bit separately. But when I make lists for kids, I am usually I'm putting at least two, if not three of those, you know, division one, division two, division three or NAIA on, on a student's list because I really want them to cast a wide net over the types of schools they should be considering, knowing that not everything's going to be perfect. The kid who gets to go to a college that's the absolute perfect fit for them for so many reasons, when you put athletics in the mix, that doesn't always happen the way you thought it would. It, you know, I really do believe that um, you always have to keep fit in mind with this and that the student athlete has to come to conclusions about the coaches that want them, the schools that want them. They have to want them back, right. you know, at, in order to make this all work. So um, I think that it's uh, it's there's a, there's always a balancing game that has to go on. But if you start with casting a wide net over the types of schools you eventually can funnel down to those that are really the right fit. And then the student athlete can hopefully make a, a good choice at the end. Yeah, it's and so it is. It's still very much a, a best fit scenario. And there's all these puzzle pieces that you have to fit together, which is why there are experts like you <laughs> do this. <laughs> Um, so what about the junior? You mentioned the transfer and how that has become quite a big thing. And I know in my area, I work a lot with student athletes at the community college level. Um, and so how does that factor into this whole picture now? Is that a benefit to students? Does that put them behind if they start at the community college? There's a whole separate organization for community college athletes, correct? Exactly. So you're going to find that with the community colleges, um, there are many reasons why going to community college first as the, as the first two years is a smart move. It can be financial, it can be academic, it can be a combination of things. It could be just, I need to be close to home because of family reasons or whatever it is. But just knowing that you can um, have that as a two-year opportunity to grow, to maybe reset for kids who needed that to, you know, didn't maybe come out of high school with a strong enough GPA to get to where they wanted to go. Um, the, we have, uh, there are two separate community college uh, athletics groupings. You've got the California community colleges. They're, I mean, for all the community colleges in California that offer athletics, they're on one. And then you've got the National Junior College Athletic Association, and that's kind of everybody else. 
Um, so the typical process though, is that you, even as a student athlete wanting to go there, you have to reach out to those coaches because they cannot, but if they don't know that you exist, they are not knocking down your door. However, I will say that community college that are in your local area who might come to your high school games, for example, because, you know, especially towards the end of your season, if things are going well, they're trying to find those best local kids, the ones who are planning to stay local, right, and entice them to, you know, think, think about the community college option. If in, I know in the state of California, if you are trying to get recruited by a community college and you're thinking about, you know, I'd like to go to a community college, but I want to go up to Santa Barbara. <laughs> I don't want to live in uh, in my I'm, I'm OK renting an apartment and living like a, a kind of a pseudo normal college student, but doing community college. That's OK. But you have you, the student athlete, have to be the one to um, introduce yourself to those coaches. They cannot if you're out of their region, they can't recruit you necessarily. Um, so you have the student athlete has to be the one to um, pursue that. But those are all possibilities. And then the, also the added other benefit is that those community college coaches, they're what they love to promote is where their student athletes have gone on to transfer to the four year colleges. So you've got somebody as an advocate there to really help you get to the four year college, hopefully of your choice, um, because of relationships that those coaches have. And, um, you know, it can be there are so many things that are there's always this. I feel like the sand is always shifting in the world of of athletics, right? On any given team, you can look at a roster and say, wow, it looks like they've got, you know, they don't need any more of whatever position I play. But you know what? You didn't know that th this kid was going to quit or this kid was going to transfer or this one, you know, was maybe Not graduating sure. out or, you know, like there's just every year it's, you know, or the coach was going to get fired <laughs> and somebody else would be coming in. So there's, there's always opportunity. And I think that if you, if community college is the right way to go, for whatever reason that is, just know that that is another pathway to play college athletics at, at a four-year school. So then the last, um, th there are two other options. One is intramurals, which is just kind of like a free-for-all, just go play your sport and, you know, you're just playing with people that are not, um, um, you know, in your, in your area, I mean, that have competed. Um, right. And then the other aspect is club. So talk about club and what that might, you know, what so and club can be just as competitive as division one or division two, right? Yes, club can still be very, very competitive. Um, so for those athletes who, you know, some of sometimes if you really want to go to, let's say, I really want to go to a big school, but and I want to go to a school that's in division one but I'm not getting recruited for, by their by their athletic teams. I keep getting recruited by smaller schools that maybe that's not the best fit for me, right? So you choose to go to a division one school. Well, then you just show up at their, you know, at club clubs might, might hold tryouts or they might just say, hey, come join the team. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, depends on the sport. It depends on how competitive things are. But, um, but yeah, club athletics can be a great way to stay active and still very, very competitive. Um, I know that my daughter is going to be playing club water polo at Georgia Tech, and she's really excited about the fact that it's just the right level for her. She didn't, you know, she knew that she wasn't going to go play, uh, you know, um, D1 water polo. So to be able to know that she can uh, play club is perfect. It's still, it gets enough, you know, it gets her the exercise she's looking for, the level of competitiveness that's going to be just right on for where she is as an athlete, and um, a whole bunch of friends who have a similar passion um, for a sport that she loves. So, you know, at the end of the day, that, that can be a really great way to stick with it. Or like you're saying with, with intramurals or even other club sports, Say that you played three sports. I mean, like for me, when I uh, when I left the soccer team, I looked at playing club volleyball. I looked. I really wasn't interested in playing club soccer because I kind of felt like there was just too much that was too close. It was hitting a little too close to home for me. So I thought I'd I'll go do something else. But there were a lot of other sports that I'm like I had never picked up a lacrosse stick before. I had never you know tried some of these other things. So. For kids who are athletic, who really try to learn something new and try something new and make more friends, like I really encourage you to try, um, you know, the intramural can be, uh, it's, it's 
maybe less competitive than club. The club is still allows you to play as a team, practice as a team, go to tournaments, play against other schools and have that kind of competitive experience. Whereas intramurals is mostly just you playing against other teams at your own school. Yeah, it's much more like a pickup game type yeah, of Yeah, pickup game is a great way to describe the thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's an aspect that a lot of times students or parents are not aware of and and can be a really strong viable option for for them. So, that's, you know, that gives us a pretty good clear understanding of those different, you know, aspects and options. So one last question before we wrap up, Katie, what would you say is the biggest myth that you hear um, about playing a sport in college that you would like to bust? What, especially as counselor and advisors, what's the biggest myth we can help bust out there? Well, there's quite a few of them. <laughs> Athletics has <laughs> definitely got a few of them going, but I would, I would say the one that I hear the most that uh that kids and families don't necessarily understand or trust is that their grades still matter a lot they seem to many athletes come at this whole college athletics recruiting piece with well does it really matter what i'm doing in the classroom and the answer is absolutely yes um every college coach out there wants to, they want to recruit the kid who's got the talent level that you know will help them win right but they also want to recruit mature responsible students who are strong in the classroom and who they will not have to chase after every day to make sure that they're doing their homework and they're staying on top of you know their academics right to so you know and at some schools you're going to find that um you truly need to be the cream of the crop student in order to even be considered um, I get Ivy League, you know, parents coming to me all the time saying, oh, well, my student's gonna, definitely Ivy League quality student athlete. And when I ask questions around, okay, so let's look at the student's transcript. And I see that the student athlete has a 4.0, but has never taken an honors or an AP class. That's a problem. <laughs> that student, while they look, while the number goes, ooh, ah, right? You look at the transcript and you say, no, 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 this isn't going to fly at, a, at an Ivy League school. Um, so it's really, really, grades are important, rigor matters, um, test scores, if you can get that, you know, again, the, the test score question is, I think, uh, uh, one of those shifting questions. For now, many schools do not require them and they're test optional and you can take advantage of that. But we are every year we are seeing uh, schools revisiting that question over and over and some of them in that super, super top, you know, um, like, you know, single digit acceptance rate level category are starting to change their minds back <laughs> to requiring test scores. So um, having a test score that is uh, representative of your academic uh, you know, abilities is could still be important to you. So yeah, academics matter. Academics, great. Katie, thank you so much. I know we could probably spend another three hours talking about this. So, so we'll, <laughs> we'll cover other topics and, and through other avenues. But thank you so much. This has just been very informative. And I know my students will really appreciate it. And, and it's good to have a professional that you can say, don't, it's like being a parent. You know, it's not just me telling you this as a counselor or advisor. Um, listen, I, here's an expert who is telling you the same thing. So, so you are our expert telling the students the things that, that we're trying to tell them. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>